What we're trying to do when we build biomedical ontologies is to capture very general biomedical truths. And the way in which you can best understand what sorts of truths we're interested in is by thinking them as being the truths which create the terminological skeleton of the theory. So every scientific theory uses technical terms. These technical terms refer to entities which the scientists working in that theory have discovered and which they need to find a technical term for. Those technical terms are, have definitions. Now, the scientists themselves are not very necessarily very good at formulating definitions. In some disciplines, they are better at formulating the definitions. In some disciplines, they're no good at all. In some disciplines, they have a chaos of, of not quite consistent definitions. The job of the ontologist is to take that skeletal core of a scientific theory, the terminological core, and formulate definitions for the terms. Now, those definitions will then imply certain truths. For instance, they will imply that one kind of entity is a kind, a subkind of another kind of entity. So if an A is defined as a B which sees, then that definition implies that all A's are B's. And that's a truth. So the definitions correspond to certain very general truths, I boringly, excruciatingly, boringly general truths. That is our job, to create representations of excruciatingly, boringly general truths. Now, there are the truths that we are going to be examining are not just truths which are implied by the definitions. There are also truths which relate the entities that the definitions represent in other ways, which is slightly more interesting, but still usually uh, boring. Um, all right, now we're doing this within certain frameworks, such as OWL, in order that people can utilize these very boring general truths and the terms which are used to express them in order to do reasoning over biomedical data. That's the primary purpose. The more we get more and more biomedical data, which is created by more and more different communities in more and more different disciplines, each of them using somewhat different terminologies, which overlap in a more or less happy way, the more something like ontology is needed in order to bring some kind of order to this gigantic, gigantic monster of big data which is being created. Now, there are two ways of doing this. Um, one way uh, is the armchair way called top-down ontology development. You have an idea in your mind what a cell is or what an organism is, and you write a definition, and then you, you work out uh, the subkinds of cell, again, from y y what you know, what, what is in your mind, and you write definitions of those subkinds, until eventually you reach lower and lower levels of the entire structure of cell biology. Now, I believe that part of the top-down methodology makes sense. I think that for doing very, very high-level organization, we need a top-down methodology. And that methodology is encapsulated in BFO, which is what we're going to be talking about in part two. Um, but as soon as you start working with entities which are not completely generic, such as objects, or process, and you start working with entities which belong to a given domain, like cell or hemopoietic cell, then working out things on the basis of reasoning inside your mind or inside the mind of you and other people who have similar concerns is not good enough. There you have to test what you propose against real data and real experiments. So you have to work with real biologists or with real clinicians who know what a hemopoietic cell is, for instance. So we need a bottom-up methodology combined with a top-down methodology. And uh, the, the top-down methodology 
will seem to be predominating in what I have to say today, but that's only because today I'm talking primarily about the most general principles and the most general architecture beneath which the domain ontologies, which deal with specific areas of biology or medicine, will fall. They will inherit their generic structure from BFO, and then they will fall at lower levels beneath that generic structure. All right, now there are various different words for all of this. I don't care, really, uh, about the relationships between those things. So for me, an ontology is a, a terminology, a collection of terms with definitions, which has been formalized in a logical system which makes it machine-readable. That's more or less it. Now, some people call that a controlled vocabulary. Some people call it a controlled structured vocabulary. It is a kind of coding system. I don't have any objection to that. The, the, it's important that there are two parts to an ontology, both the textual part, which consists of words of a language like English or medical English or cell biologists English, definitions that they would accept. In other words, the speakers of cell biology English would accept those definitions, and then formalizations in a formal language like our. You need both of those components. You need the first component because human beings will, will be required to maintain the ontologies that you build, and you need the second component because they need to be useful when you start doing reasoning inside computers. The terminological part of a scientific theory consists of general nouns or general noun phrases, such as, for instance, hemo hematopoetic cell. General nouns and noun phrases refer to general entities, which in BFO are called universals. And we're going to use the term universal as a technical term. We will see that some general nouns do not refer to universals, uh, but the main ones that we'll be interested in for the moment are those general nouns like electron or cell or organism or planet, which refer to universals. And we're going to allow all kinds of things to be universal. So email is a universal. Ford Pinto, if there are Ford Pintos, how would I know, is a universal. Um, city is a universal. But these things are not universals. These are all individuals. So blood pressure is a universal, but my blood pressure is an individual. My blood pressure is an instance of the universal blood pressure. And similarly, um, my ca cardiologist now we have to be careful here. My cardiologist is an instance of the universal person who happens to be a cardiologist, but there is no universal cardiologist for reasons which I will explain. Um, all right, so these are examples of universals. And note, I don't say cardiologist, I don't say physician here, I say physician role. Why is physician role a universal, but physician is not a universal? Now, this, a simple answer to this question is that this, it, it, it really is simple. It won't sound simple when I say it, but it really is simple. If something is a universal, then all its instances will have to be instances of it. So if something is a physician, they don't have to be a physician. They could be a golfer or a football player or, a, I don't know, an ontologist. Um, but if something is a physician role, it's pretty well stuck to be being a physician role. There's only one thing it can be. So my, th well, his physician role is just a physician role. It was a physician role from the first instant of its existence, and it will be a physician role until he dies. It's his physician role. Now, it sounds odd, but this is really a, a sort of important. Uh, universals are things which that instances instantiate necessarily at all times. They can't lose them. A rabbit cannot cease to be a rabbit. A rabbit can cease to be a happy rabbit. It can cease to be a living rabbit, perhaps but it can't cease to be a rabbit. Rabbit is a universal, or we're going to assume that it's a universal anyway. Um, now, 
we have all of these people creating lots of data using lots of terminologies and we want to create ontolo ontological frameworks which are going to support the unification integration comparison of all of these data. That's a really difficult job. And th the only way we're going to have a hope of being successful is if we have some common rules, as simple as possible, which are easy to communicate, easy to teach, easy to follow, and which will make, make it easier for people, for instance, to write good definitions. When ontology in biomedicine first started, which was in about 1998, people created a hugely successful ontology called the gene ontology, and they defined every term. But they had no idea how to write definitions, and so they made a mess of it. And now we do know how to write definitions, and so now the gene ontology is, in this respect, a much better artifact, more useful, and less error-prone. All right, so I believe I just said all of that. So the, the, the more our ontologies follow rules, the more we're going to be able to create software which will enable people to reason with those ontologies, which will work from one ontology to the next, and just not just for those ontologies that are built in your lab or in my lab. So the goal is to have these basic principles be accepted by everyone. And BFO is now accepted by hundreds of organizations who are building ontologies. We want to have BFO accepted by all organizations building ontologies. And, uh, well, we'll see. Um, now, some simple rules. Um, these are rules of thumb. But still, they are. Uh, th you should try and follow them as hard as you can. Sometimes you will find you will fail for one reason or another. The first rule is univocity. That is to say, if you have a term in your ontology, then it should have the same meaning on every occasion when you use it or when anyone using your ontology will use it. Now, an example of why somebody might not follow that rule and it's not a very good example, but it will do, is where somebody is building an ontology for a purpose which is directed towards two communities, both of which use a certain term, but they use it with a certain completely different meaning. So, for instance, I, d I said it was a bad example, so uh, don't worry about what I say next. If somebody is interested in cell biology in prison environments, then they might want to use the word cell in two different ways. Now, they should still try to avoid having to do that because of this rule of thumb, but they might, they might necessarily have to use the same word for two different kinds of entity. Now, they can alleviate the computational problems which flow from this because each term in an ontology has an ID, and you can give cell, as in biology, one ID and then give cell, as in prison cell, another ID. So you can solve the problem to a large extent, but human beings, although much cleverer than computers, are still stupid in some contexts. And so having the same term mean two different things might cause problems for human beings. All right, now the second rule is positivity. There are no negative universals. Uh, so there, there is a universal mammal, but there is no universal non-mammal. There is a universal um, violin, but there is no, non -un uh, there is no universal non-violin. Um, there are no non-universals at all. Non-smoker is not the, the rep name of a universal. A non-smoker is like a cardiologist. It's the name of something about human beings. So... A non-smoker is a, is a human being who happens to have the attribute that the, he or she doesn't smoke, roughly speaking. It's more technical than when you get down to clinical trials, but uh, for the moment this will do. Now, these are all examples of defined classes. And I said earlier that not everything that is referred to by means of a common noun or a common noun phrase is a universal and the, the reason is that there are some common nouns and common noun phrases which refer to groups of entities 
but in such a way that the members of that group don't instantiate that universe, that, the, 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 that term at all times when they exist. So pets may go, may go feral, feral, and then they're not pets anymore. They're still the little rabbit that you bought uh, 10 years ago. They're still the same entity, but they are no longer pets. And so pet cannot be a universal. And similarly, we may be friends with Russia one day. And so enemy cannot be a universal. It is what we are calling defined class. So a defined class is, is not an extra entity. Uh, universals are entities, roles are entities, qualities are entities, objects are entities, but defined classes are not extra entities. We treat them as if they were, but really they're just ways of speaking. They're, they are a way of cheating, a way, of, a, a, a trick, if you like. And I hate tricks, uh, but this is the one trick that I have been forced to um, accept. Um, all right, so in each case, a defined class is a restriction on a universal. That's probably a good, uh, a, a good rule of thumb. And so these are the universals which are responsible here for these restrictions. So the, in, in philosophy, that people talk about a façon de parler. So there are no sakes in the world, for Christ's sake. Uh, but there is a façon de parler, a way of speaking about things which seems to, res to quantify over sakes. If you suppose that sakes really exist, you'll be making a mistake. And similarly, if you sp suppose that pets really exist, there are animals on the one hand and pets on the other hand, then you'll be making a mistake. All right, now the third rule is objectivity. One of the mistakes that the gene ontology made at the very beginning was that they assumed that there were special sorts of ligands called unlocalized ligands. And what they meant was that there are ligands and they didn't know where they were, but that's not an ontological feature of those ligands, it's just a feature of our epistemological deficits. So ontology should never include terms which express states of knowledge. SNOMED, I think, is, is contains terms like uh, presumed, uh, chronic, presumptive, uh, or uh, classified as, and so forth. And those terms are just a sign of bad ontology. Now, you can fix them by having an, an ontology of the findings or diagnoses or diagnostic assertions. You can say this diagnostic assertion is asserted as definitive. This diagnostic assertion is asserted as speculative and so on. You can have an ontology of evidence, if you like, and people indeed are working on such an ontology. And then you can combine the data that you have about the assertions with the data that you have about the evidence and do justice to what the gene ontology and SNOMED are trying to do, were trying to do justice to in the case of the gene ontology by using these epistemological markers, subjective markers, uh, in what should be always something objective. So this is not just a, a rule retain, re regarding the use of certain expressions. This is a rule regarding how you should view the ontologist's job. It's not to describe what's going on in your own mind or what the beliefs are in your own community. It has nothing to do with beliefs or knowledge. It has to do with the world. Now, the world contains beliefs. So they, there is an ontology called the mental functioning ontology, which is an ontology of things like beliefs and perceptions and so forth. But it's an objective ontology in just the same sense that every other ontology is objective. All right. Now, the fourth rule is somewhat um, um, controversial. And um, I guess it would be good to provide some history. Um, so when I started working with the gene ontology, my job was to teach them how to write definitions, roughly speaking. And I, I, for a time, I was quite influential. And one of the rules which I uh, propagated was that the gene ontology should be a true hierarchy. That is to say, it should have 
It should be divided into three ontologies, as it was from the beginning, but each one of them should be a true mathematical hierarchy. And what that means is that every term should have exactly one parent, so that there is only one root to the, to the one root R O U T E to the root R double O T node of the ontology. The gene ontology is still not like that, although it's much more like that than it would have been if I had not been uh, around at that time. Uh, but the the question still remains, is it a good thing to avoid multiple inheritance? And I still think that it is a very good rule of thumb that if you're building an ontology, you should try to make it so that every term in your ontology will have exactly one parent, unless it's the root, R at double O-T, in which case it has no parent. Now, why is this a good rule? First of all, because it makes it easier to write definitions, as we shall see. It makes it so that writing definitions and quality checking the ontology support each other directly. And if God were making the world, he would make it so that there was no multiple inheritance. Um, that's a simplification of the longer statement, which I won't bother you with. Um, so... But there are many cases where there it's not, not obvious where the, which the parent should be. So if you have um, congenital meningitis, for instance, is that to be classified under meningitis or is it to be classified under congenital diseases? There's no obvious correct answer. And in fact, it's hard to work out general principles, even rules of thumb, to... Uh, to um, settle such, such questions, and so in many standard ontologies, people allow, particularly ontologies of disease, people allow multiple inheritance. And I will go on fighting it, and they will go on saying, no, it's good, good thing, multiple inheritance. It's uh, perfectly harmless, they will say. Now, I believe that in every case where you have multiple inheritance, you can get rid of it without doing any harm to the ontology. And I'm going to show you how to do that. And then I'm going to show you how to put it back so that you please the people who think you need it. So I think it's obvious how we solve this problem, how we get rid of multiple inheritance in a case like this. We've already seen how we do it. We create the defined class PEC, and then we, um, we just don't put PEC in our ontology of animals and mammals and dogs and cats we put PEC somewhere else under the defined classes. And I'll, I'll talk something about where it goes in a minute. Um, in fact, I'll talk about where it goes immediately. <laughs> so reference ontologies are where things like dog, animal, mammal, cell, organism, electron, um, city, uh, poem, email go. They are defined for global purposes. They should be reusable over and over again because people will build defined class expressions using the terms from reference ontologies. And if we all use the same reference ontologies, those defined class expressions will be processable by computers in such a way that they kick back the same <coughs> information. Application ontologies are ontologies built for a particular local purpose which might be a clinical trial or a collection of clinical trials or a whole hospital. They may have a special def collection of defined classes for the specific areas of the hospital or the specific machines and so on. And so we, this is perfectly reasonable, I guess. You may have an, uh, uh, an application ontology in which you are doing experiments on, on non-smokers in Buffalo and you have a, a defined class, Buffalo non-smoker. And all Buffalo non-smokers are subjects in clinical trial number 227 because it's a clinical trial of all Buffalo non-smokers. And all Buffalo non-smokers are human beings. And um, So that would be perfectly acceptable in an application ontology. 
Okay, so uh, let's have a pause for questions here. I'm going to come back to the, um, the way in which we deal with multiple inheritance and defined classes later, but are there any questions so far? You're working in a domain that's uh, already at the level where you need these application, like defined classes and yeah. so on. So should you create two separate files, and one is the, the domain and then the reference, and then the other one is the sort of extension with the applications? So I don't think it will be two. I think it will be multiple. You create the reference ontologies, all of them, ideally so that all your defined classes can be defined using terms from one or other of these reference ontologies, plus perhaps a list of particulars. So the planet Uranus might be a particular that you need to use in, ref in, in, in definitions of defined classes. Um, now, as soon as you start assembling these definitions of defined classes, you're going to want to put those defined classes in the ontology hierarchies in various different places. And so I believe you need to repeat everything again, but now in the unclean form, where all the defined classes are positioned in the appropriate place. So you have the editor's version of the reference ontologies. You have all the definitions of all the defined classes. And in principle, a computer can, or a reasoner, an owl reasoner, can, can generate the enhanced or enriched or unclean, as I say, reference ontologies to, to uh, be what you need. And then they'll be full of multiple inheritance. The reference ontologies will be good mathematical hierarchy, true hierarchy. And the advantage of that is that it's much easier to maintain reference ontologies. It's much easier to quality control reference ontologies if they are uh, true hierarchies. You can do things with true hierarchies very, very easily, which you can't do with tangled hierarchies. In this particular instance of an application ontology, is non-smoker a defined class? Oh, absolutely. Then? Okay. Always. Okay. So regarding an earlier example of the defined class of cardiologist, for example, and physician role, could you define a non-smoker role? Um, so I am... Um, I don't think it's so easy in that particular case. So if there were... A designated driver, a designated driver is the non-drinker. <laughs> that would be a role which someone has and then loses, uh, if he's lucky. Um, uh, but I don't think non-smoker is like that. I think the way it's defined in medical context is very, very precise, and it has to do with number of cigarettes consumed over a period. Um, so I don't think the role uh, option would work. However, if you're building an application ontology, you have a lot more freedom uh, to take shortcuts like that. The, 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 uh, the reason why I would recommend that you use a definition of non-smoker which is medically standard is because then the results of your clinical trial can be merged more easily with the results of all the other people who are doing clinical trials on non-smokers. Very soon, everybody will be a non-smoker. Any more? So I, I, I just remembered that I forgot to uh, mention that even though I am the good cop, I don't like to take breaks. So we're going to go straight through till 6.30. And if people need a break, they just leave and come back. All right. Um, so we, we're going to have to do a lot of work on definitions in the, in the next hour or so. And the building definitions is a, uh, I, I was tempted to say it's a fine art. It's very difficult. It's very difficult because what we're trying to do when we build definitions is we're not merely trying to define one word at a time with an appropriate definition. We're trying to define words which form a group of interconnected words in such a way that there is a natural flow from the simplest words, which logically simplest words, which will be at the very top of our hierarchy, 
down and down and down to more complicated words, phrases, um, which will have correspondingly more complicated definitions. And the idea is that definitions are a way of allowing the computer to, to mimic a certain feature of human intelligence that is uh, not very often reflected upon. So we have lots of general nouns that we use all the time, like non-smoker or um, elm tree or um, uh, epidemic or AIDS epidemic or the Asian AIDS epidemic. We use these general nouns all the time. And we can say very, very complicated things about very, very complicated goings on in the world just by using two or three general words. And the reason why we can do that is because each one of those general words is defined in terms of other words, and those are defined in terms of other words. And we never care about those definitions. We never care to unpack what we mean by epidemic or AIDS or Asia. Uh, we just rely on using those general terms. Now, that means we can say things much more quickly, communicate much more effectively, um, and we can do it reliably, provided if the worst comes to the worst, we or someone else who knows what the definition of epidemic is can unpack our definition, or who knows what an elm tree is. I don't really know what an elm tree is, but I can use the word, mean elm tree. Now, computers can do the same thing. Computers can formulate very complex propositions, which, when fully written out, may take six or ten lines of text in just four or five symbols, because each of those symbols has been defined, and each of the definitions uses other symbols which have been defined, and each of those definitions uses other symbols which have been defined, until eventually you reach the end of the defining process. And it, there has to be an end of the defining process. I hope you you realize why that is. Otherwise, there would be turtles all the way down. So there, there has to be something which is not defined. Now, our job is to create such chains of definition. And the, as I say, there are rules for doing this, but it's not easy. And uh, now... What do the definitions do? If we have a definition like hematopoietic cell, that definition is going to explain how that term relates to a universal, which relates to certain other universals at lower levels, which have instances which are parts of reality, which you can actually go and inspect and do experiments with. Um, So we're, we, what, what we're doing is we're, we're using the definitions to link the terms in the ontology to portions of reality, to real cells, real s processes going on inside cells, real processes going on inside organisms, relationships between processes going on inside organisms and processes going on inside cells, and so on. So we're trying to mirror reality by means of definitions. And um, I, I said that ontology is trying to capture the terminological content of a scientific theory. The instances in reality, the actual cells, the actual organisms and so forth, are captured by experiments or by the, the, the treatment of patients. So scientific experiments are about instances, scientific theories about universals. And the instances, the information about the instances is what tells us what holds of the universal. And this is the bottom-up methodology. We, we look at the results of experiments in order to decide what is true of hematopoietic cells. All right, now, every universal has to have at least one instance. Um, so this is a rule of thumb. Uh, I'm quite willing to confess that there might be exceptions to this rule. Uh, particularly if we take time seriously. So there are no dodos. But probably you would put dodo on a list of universals. 
probably. Um, it could be that there were never any fists, that no one ever did that. Now, that could be a problem for this thesis. Um, this, that's not a very convincing example, but it could be that there are no fists for a given five-minute interval, this world non-fisting day. Um, but that might have another meaning. Um, and anyway, not everyone would follow the rule. Okay, so that we can order universals into children and parents or into uh, descendants and ancestors. And if we have an ordering like that, then the parent has more instances than the child. All right? And then there is a technical term in the ontology world which is the term extension, and ex the extension of a universal is the class of all its instances. So it's the collection, the totality of all its instances. And so th this is how it's organized. There is a root node, for instance, substance, and then there is a leaf node, for instance, Siamese cat. Um, and then there are instances. So this is my knowledge of biology here, encapsulated. Uh, now, th this is another way of stating that we don't believe in multiple inheritance. It's not actually exactly the same proposition. There are subtle issues afoot here, but the, no cat is ever a dog and no dog is ever a cat because, well, you can't see it here, but if, if I knew more biology, you would see dog here. Dogs are mammals. No dog is ever a cat, and no cat is ever a dog. That is the rule of single inheritance applied to that particular example. And then uh, a fortiori, distinct lowest universals, if there are any, it may be that, there are, that ontology can go on getting more and more fine-grained, but if we assume that there are leaf nodes representing lowest universals, then leaf universals in a given ontology never share instances. All right. Now, th there are lots of problems with um, current ontology work because, as, you, as we know from SNOMED, for instance, and as, as you all know from listening to Dr. Koesters, um, SNOMED doesn't really deal with time very well, and it doesn't really deal with instances very well. And so our ontologies, many of which are like SNOMED in both of those respects, don't integrate very well. It's very hard to integrate data collected using SNOMED with data collected using ICD and so forth. And so what we, that is to say Dr. Koisters or Vermeer, as I will uh, occasionally say if I'm feeling Flemish, um, what we've been trying to do over the years is to create the framework which will enable this integration to be more effective. And we've had some influence. We've embarrassed a lot of people humiliated a lot of people. We have believers even. Uh, there is statistical documentation of the, the effects we're having so that certain assumptions can be which we attack can statistically be shown to have been uh, dropping off with time and the assumptions that we favor rising in time. Um, our influence has been primarily in biology. Uh, to a lesser degree, we've been influential in medical ontology, but still influential. And um, the BFO is one heart of this set of principles designed to support integration. And then reference tracking is the other heart of this approach, which you, ha you have heard from Werner about at various times, and we'll hear more about and you'll hear a little bit about reference tracking from me. So the reason why SNOMED does not deal with time very well or with instances very well is because it grew as a terminology. It grew um, effectively by people who were interested in nomenclatures, in words, not in things. So MESH is another example of this syndrome. MESH stands for medical subject headings, and there is a gigantic a precursor entity called 
Library of Congress subject headings, and MeSH was created like the Library of Congress subject headings by librarians. Um, and in some ways, it's an ontology of documents rather than an ontology of entities in biomedical reality. And the UMLS is in the same boat. NCIT is somewhat different, although it, NCIT has some of the features of a compilation of terminological content from elsewhere. All of these artifacts are trying in small or large ways to turn themselves into ontologies, which means being able to deal with things like time and instances in a s consistent and sophisticated way, but none of them have really succeeded. Now, and I'll give you an example. So I'm not sure now which of these actually made this mistake, but m many, many terminologies made this mistake. They, they introduced the is our relation, but they defined it as a relation of meaning. So disease prevention is more specific in meaning than disease, so there is an is our relation here. And cancer documentation is more specific in meaning than cancer. Um, <laughs> that came from the UMLS. Um, or anyway, uh, I, maybe I was making a joke, but you can find things like that in the UMLS. Vitamin, part of experimental protocol. That's because there are experimental protocols which mention vitamins. And that's not good, ontologically speaking. And HL7, I uh, it just makes me sick. Um, I'm not even going to let you see how nonsensical it is because I wasted so many years of my life attacking HL7. Now it's now dead practically, but it's it's been reborn. It's something called fire, um, and I still haven't made up my mind why wh whether fire is completely bad or not. Um, Uh, but if you're interested, you should read the, an entry in my HL7 blog called The Weight of the Baby. It's the funniest thing Vanna ever wrote. Um. All right, so this is, I've again, I've forgotten where this came from, but the I guess some history is, uh, is, is in order here. So one of the reasons why SNOMED and so forth went wrong is because in different ways they all thought that they were creating ontologies of concepts. So ideas in people's minds, units of knowledge, something like that. And if, you're, if you think ontology is about ideas in people's minds, then you're not go really going to see the relationship between those ideas and the entities in reality which correspond to them. You're going to be focusing on the words that they use to express them or the meanings of those words. And, and then you're going to have to deal with things like part of. Well, what is it to say that the concept A is part of the concept B? No one really can get a grip on that. It, it's not the kind of question that has an obvious sense. If you say, what is it that makes a heart part of an organism, then you understand it involves something like spatial location and functional integration. Um, so a piece of shrapnel is not part of an organism, even when it's in the interior of an organism. So being part of an organism means to be in the interior and to be functionally integrated, roughly. But what does it mean to say that the concept is part of another concept? doesn't mean anything. But that's what they said, and therefore they created confused definitions. Um, now, how do we do it properly? Well, we, first of all, we, we consider the simplest case, A is a B. And we're not going to think of A and B as concepts. We're going to think of them as universals in reality, in the first case. We're defined classes will be... Um, will come along for the ride. So in such circumstances, A is a B means all the instances of A are not for accidental reasons, but as a matter of biological science or as a matter of scientific truth, 
also instances of B. Now that is about instances. You've already built instances into the core relation of every ontology from the very start. That's also the basis for the structure of OWL. That's how OWL deals with ISA, by treating ISA as a variant of the subclass relationship, where subclass is defined exactly in this way. A subclass B means all the instances of A are instances of B. And um, now, there may be a time factor. Uh, and we have to remember always that something, in some cases, something can be an instance of A at one time, but not be an instance of A at another time. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to make sure that, as far as possible, all our A's and B's are names of universals, because then we have an easy way of treating this time factor. And that's one of the reasons for the, all of these roles in the system, in order to make sure that we're doing justice to time. So one of the application areas where BFO has been quite successful is in military intelligence. And the military intelligence world created lots of ontologies which didn't pay attention to time. And so they had no way of dealing with the fact that one and the same building might be a school during the day and a bomb factory at night. Or it might be a school during the school hours, but then a bank during all the other hours. Uh, because they didn't have roles. They just had classes of entities, schools, banks, hospitals, bomb factories, and so forth. Now, having roles, you can solve all of the problems which arise because of multiple uses of the same building automatically. All right. So we, we need not just to look at universals. We need to look at instances. And we need to look at time. And if we do that, then we can link the ontology to the data which is compiled in our electronic health record in a sensible way rather than in the way which SNOMED imposes upon us because its coding system does not take account of time. With ISA, it's easy because ISA only holds between universals. So when we say John is a human, we're not using the same is a. What we really mean is instance of. But part of holds between universals and between instances. So the universal heart, someone might reasonably say, is part of the universal organism. In fact, many ontologists have been saying that ever since the gene ontology, uh, probably even before that. But then also, my heart is part of me. And what we have to do is distinguish two part of relations. There is the instance level part of relation, and then there is the universals level part of relation. And the latter is defined in terms of the former. We define universals level part of in terms of instance level part of. This is probably the most important lesson that you can learn today. Whenever you make a statement in an ontology which relates one universal or even one concept or one term to another at the level of universals, in other words, at the level of what is general, then you have to make sure, and when it's a relation like part of or derived from or uh, attached to or um, whatever relation it might be other than is a, which is a special case, you have to, first of all, make it clear whether you're dealing with relations between universals or between instances. But secondly, you have to define the universal relation using the all sum rule. So what this means is A part of B at the universal's level means that for all instances of A and all times T, if A is an instance of, sorry, if little a is an instance of big A at T, then there is some instance of little b, sorry, there is some instance little b of big B, such that little a stands to little b in the instance level part of relation. Now, you should test every ontology link that you create against this all sum rule. 
So what it means to say that heart as a universal is part of organism as a universal is that every heart is part of some organism. What it means to say that wheel universal is part of vehicle universal is every wheel part of some vehicle. Now, of course, it's false that every wheel is part of some vehicle, and so that you have to get rid of that link. Now, you may be able to switch it around and say every vehicle has part wheel. So sometimes these things work in one direction, but they don't work in the other direction. And you have to make sure that you get the right direction if it only works in one direction. And now I'll go back to what I had earlier. So there are, in fact, three kinds of relations. There are relations between universals, like part of, we just dealt with that. Relations between instances, like my heart is part of me, and relations between an instance and a universal, such as the instance of relation. Another one would be the is uh, allergic to. I am allergic to penicillin. Is a relation between an instance and a universal. Another one would be knows about, in the sense of has general knowledge about penicillin. It, so the, you've already worked out the big A means universal, little a means uh, instance, and then italics non-bold means the relation between universals and non-italics bold is the relation between instances. And it's not as easy as we thought. I already pointed out that the direction might matter. But in some cases, um, we, we would think that the direction sh couldn't matter. So adjacent to, surely it's symmetric. If, if, if A is adjacent to B, then B is going to be adjacent to A. That's obvious, isn't it? But it's not because while the nucleus in a cell is adjacent to the cytoplasm, always, it's not necessarily true that all cytoplasm is adjacent to some nucleus. It may be cytoplasm in a far remote corner of a cell, or it may be cytoplasm in the denucleated cell. So even though adjacency looks like a symmetrical relation, it's not symmetric. And another one is Seminal vesicle adjacent to urinary bladder. Every seminal ve vesicle is adjacent to some urinary bladder. But women don't have seminal vesicles. And so it's not true in the opposite direction. Now, there is another problem with the all sum rule. Let's suppose that we define A part of B in this way. If you try and formalize that in logic, in OWL anyway, then you, you will think you have succeeded, but you will have, in fact, failed. And the reason is because in, in formulating this in OWL, what you end up formulating is that the B, which serves as the host, as the whole, with a W, for the A part, the little a part, is always the same B. But there are scenarios where the universal A it truly is part of the universal B. In other words, every A is part of some B, but some A's drift from one B to another. So they, they always satisfy the need to have a whole which they're part of, and that whole must always be a B, but it doesn't have to be the same B. Now, that's not very intuitive for the whole case, but if we think of B has part A, there are many intuitive examples, uh, certain kinds of um, cells which have to be part of your skin. It's so uh, the, every, um, every skin tissue involves cells such and such as part, but it doesn't have to be the same cell. And so that is a, a very difficult problem, not for ontology or for BFO, but for OWL, why it's a problem and what the solution might be. This is another example illustrating the, the all sum rule. So Every zygote derives from some ovum or from some sperm. Um, so that's fusion. We could do this, a similar thing for splitting. You see, we're dealing both with, in order to understand the ontology of this universal level relation, we have to look at both time and instances. If we always use the same relations, then we can link them together. So if we know that A is a B and B is a C, then we know that A is a C. If we know that A is part of B and B is part of C, then we know that A is part of C and so on.
But we can only do that if people use the same relations with the same meaning. That's what this strategy of using definitions enforces. Simino wrote a very influential paper on how medical uh, vocabulary should look in the future. And he was a defender of the concept orientation. So the SNOMED idea that we create a lo long collection of concepts, we give them definitions, and we use those concepts over and over again in tagging our data about patients. It looks like this. The, in, in the Simino SNOMED world, we have a concept patient, a concept diabetes, and we have the patient, and the diabetes is over here too. And what we want to say is that there is something on the side of the patient which corresponds to what we would call the universal diabetes. There has to be an instance of the universal diabetes. This, this, this kind of three-cornered view holds for ICD also. ICD is not the classification of diseases. It's a classification of patients. So this poor lady is a patient because of this, and this is missing because they don't have an ontology of disease. They don't have a relation between the disease and the patient. What we have here are four things. We have an instance of human being, an instance of disease, and then the universal human being and the universal disease. So this is a four-category ontology. And if we, have, if, we, if we start with this, then we don't, need to, we don't need to talk about concepts. We just have uh, the universals and the instances. The reason why Semino and SNOMED and ICD arose as they do, or part of the reason is because people saw medical records not as being records about what is happening on the side of the patient, but rather records of what the doctor says or thinks or believes. So it's a record which copies what the doctor says or knows and converting what he says into code, SNOMED code. And then the, the result is that we have a, a gap between the codes themselves and what it is in reality that might, they might correspond to. The codes are general, so the very same code could be used to refer to two instances of the same disease or the same condition. And this is an example which um, Werner talks a lot about in his work on reference tracking. If you have a pimple in your uh, arm and then three years later you go back with a pimple in your arm, then is it the same pimple or is it a different pimple? Unless you have a box for the pimple instances rather than just a general code for pimple in general, you won't even be able to raise that question. And that's what reference tracking is for. So then it introduced the idea of an instance unique identifier so you can give an, a, an ID to that pimple or, or fractures or uh, epidemic outbreaks, whatever it might be, meetings even. And now the idea is that by this means, if we keep track of instances and if we keep track separately of what doctors say about those instances, what terms they use to describe those instances, then we could use the evolving system of data based on these instance IDs to identify new outbreaks or new, new patterns of symptoms that no one had, that had not been noticed before. Um, an example would be if a lot of people in a given area reported that their children had been coming home with lots of warts. And this is a, a pattern that you would recognize that just in this area, and you realize there's a swimming pool, and that all of the children had been swimming in that swimming pool. So you identify the swimming pool has its own barcode. You identify the swimming pool as a common feature in the histories of several of those children, and then the, the machine would generate a hypothesis. Maybe the swimming pool is infected. And similarly, something like this happened in the case of AIDS. It happens in the case of every new disease phenomenon, but using reference tracking would be a strategy for being able to identify that there is something going on here, some spike of a certain symptom hitherto unclassified, uh, which could point to the existence of a new disease that somebody should be investigating. And similarly with SARS. So these are all cases where people can point to instances and to patterns of instances at a certain time, but they can't point to any universal. There's nothing, no universal which all of these instances are instances of. And then eventually they identify what is a common feature and then they give a name to the disease. And now what that means is that we don't have a new concept. What that means is that we have a new disease. 
And we have the new concept for purely incidental reasons because people start using a term to describe that disease, gradually they have the concept in their mind, as they like to say. This is the idea that we will use ontologies to tag data to enable the patterns of symptoms in those data to become manifest even before the universal or universals which explain those patterns of symptoms have been identified on a general level. What we have are a lot of instances, but they form patterns. Only if we do justice to the instance data will we be able to detect those patterns. Now, that's what universals are. Universals are those features of reality in virtue of which there are general patterns. And if you think about what I've said about universals so far, you will see that that covers the cases, the sorts of cases that I've been talking about. So why are there Ford Pintos? Because somebody designed a new car and a large company started manufacturing millions of copies of it. Why is there SARS? Because a certain coronavirus began to infect human beings in certain areas like Singapore or Montreal and gave rise to a universal pattern of symptoms which then was identified as symptoms of the SARS. Similarly for AIDS, but similarly for every new term which is introduced in a science. It's introduced because people recognize patterns in reality and postulating the universal explains those patterns. So universals in reality means patterns on the side of the instances. And terminologies should be aligned to those patterns on the side of the instances rather than to the concepts in people's minds. And this is what Linnaeus did when he created this picture of the patterns on the side of organisms. Linnaeus had lots of taxonomies like this, including a taxonomy of diseases, and he probably didn't think ontologically about the relations between the entities classified over here and the entities classified over there, but that's what we are thinking about. And we're also thinking about the instances of all of these entities. And it gets more complicated, of course, because we have more ontologies linked together in various ways. So one of the ideas that we had was that we could quality control SNOMED by keeping track of all of the instances when SNOMED was used. And then if we found that some SNOMED codes were never ever used, we could timidly request that they be deleted. And if we found some SNOMED codes which were used in association with certain characteristic symptoms of error, then we could request that those codes be examined to check that they were properly codified and so on. But we, again, we can, only ha we can only do this if we're keeping track of the instances of using SNOMED. And that means giving a, a, a unique instance identifier to every time somebody writes a SNOMED code in a record and to every time some computer writes a SNOMED code. And then we were going to do the same thing for diagnostic decision support. So we would error control not just uses of SNOMED codes, but inferences from certain patterns of symptoms to certain disease hypotheses and then work out which inferences were the correct ones and then use those to support a decision support machine and th then check, of course, whether the decision support machine itself was generating uh, uh, significant numbers of errors and so that the, th the thing goes on continuously trying to improve itself with more and more data about how the new software works to help diagnosis. Yeah, let's start up talking about definitions now. Uh, and I, um, so the all sum rule is a very good quality check for an ontology assertion, A part of B, A has part B, and so on. What we need is similar uh, good checks for quality of definitions, and that's what I'm going to try and formulate now. Definitions in the ontology context are about necessary and sufficient conditions. So if you're writing a dictionary, definition writing has to do with capturing meanings to help users of the, of the dictionary. And there you don't care about circularity, you don't care about conciseness, you don't care about the definitions forming a coherent whole, you just care about one definition being a good definition to help someone reading it understand the meaning of one word. And it could be the dif dictionary only defines one word, it would still be a good dictionary if it achieves that end. 
But when we're dealing with ontologies, all the definitions have to fit together. And then we need to understand that the definition provides a set of conditions which are individually necessary and jointly sufficient. And to see an example, uh, the, this is a set of, de of conditions for being a triangle, which are individually necessary, and you can check that very easily. That means checking that every one of these things holds of every triangle. And then jointly sufficient, and to check that, what you need to do is to check that nothing satisfies all of these five conditions, which is not a triangle. So they are sufficient to give you the answer triangle in every single case. Now, the first rule about definitions is that they should not be circular. So th this is an example of a circular definition. And it's circular because it repeats the words that it's defining in the very definition, which means it can help nobody, and it's almost certainly actually going to harm computers. Now, the second rule, which is a rule of thumb, in the sense that you shouldn't you think you can use it everywhere, but you should try and use it everywhere aggressively. This is the idea of Aristotelian definitions. And I'll just show you the example. So to formulate an Aristotelian definition, you, you find the parent term in your ontology and then you try and find the specific difference. That is to say, what makes instances of the term you're trying to define differ from all the other instances of the parent term? And what makes human beings, as we all know, differ from all the other animals is that human beings are rational. I'm not saying this is necessarily a good definition. I'm saying it's an illustration of this principle. The form of a definition is an instance of a species is an instance of a genus which has this particular differentiating condition. This idea was put forward in what is still a classic of biomedical informatics, which sets forth the principles underlying the foundational model of anatomy. And I recommend that you read this piece. It truly is a wonderful piece. When I started working on biomedical ontology, this was the first piece I read which I was impressed with. If you have a definition following that rule, you already know the parent, what the parent term should be in the ontology and vice versa. This rule also does a lot to prevent circularity because it forces you to think at a higher level and then to come back down again and to think about how these things are differentiated rather than just to think about the term which you started with, which will tend to lead you in the direction of circularity. So examples from the FMA. The FMA is the foundational model of anatomy ontology. It's a gigantic ontology of anatomy. So a cell in the FMA has as its parent term anatomical structure, and every cell consists of cytoplasm surrounded by a plasma membrane. So everything which is an ana anatomical structure consisting of cytoplasm surrounded by a plasma membrane is a cell, and every cell is that. And it, then he defines plasma membrane as a cell part that surrounds the cytoplasm. I'm using this example to show you how hard you have to work to get a good system of definitions, because it, this is not enough. You have now to define cell part, check that there is no circularity, and if there is circularity, you need to think of another way of defining plasma membrane. And one way would be to define it as a part of an anatomical structure that surrounds the cytoplasm. And this, this is the main point I want to emphasize about writing definitions, that you have to think through. It's like a, a game of chess, where you have to think through three or four or five moves ahead in order to check that your definition is going to be a good definition. And if you do that, the rewards will be tremendous, because then your ontology will work. Now, this all, all of this works well for common nouns and common nouns phrases of the sort that you use in science, like plasma membrane or cell. It doesn't work so well for relations. So has membrane part, which is a, a relation that we introduced for other purposes, can be defined as a kind of Aristotelian specification of has part. Namely, has membrane part is a kind of has part which involves an instance of membrane as the part term. It, it's less elegant and also less generalizable. It's, it's not a, a recipe that works easily in the way that the recipe works 
at least to get you started when we're dealing with nouns and noun phrases. And you can see the summary of all of this here. I already said you can't keep on defining uh, forever, that, so there have to be root nodes which are primitives, or there have to be very general nodes at the top of every ontology which are primitives. Some of these might be defined in terms of terms from other ontologies at an even higher level, but that process has to stop at some stage, and BFO is where it stops. So BFO is the top level ontology which defines some terms but which leaves the absolutely undefinable terms as being primitive. And every definition in every ontology should, if, if we unpacked it, should land in some BFO expression. Now the reason why, why definitions come to an end, definitions work only if they use terms which are simpler, logically more intelligible than the term defined. Otherwise, they don't help. Gradually, you're getting down to simpler and simpler terms like object or process or quality, and that's what BFO is for. All right, now, we've already raised this issue in connection with multiple inheritance. When we come to define something, if we, it's not already in our ontology, we may not know what the appropriate parent term is, and we want to use the definitional process to help us define which parent term to use in writing a definition of a term. So let's suppose we are creating an automobile ontology, and someone says, well, we need the term blue car in our ontology. And the correct response is to say, don't be an idiot. But if he is our boss, then we have three choices. One choice is to say, well, a blue car is clearly a blue thing. Another choice is to say that a blue car is a car, which of course is the correct choice, uh, but although even then not quite. Or a third choice is to say, well, we need both, and then you have multiple inheritances. But then which should we choose? Neither of those is actually very good. The, the correct answer is we shouldn't have a blue car in our ontology. We should have two ontologies, one ontology for the colors that we use, which will vary if, uh, with the development of paint science, and another ontology, which is an ontology of the vehicles we build. And then we can swap colors around, ad lib, as we swap vehicles around, and everything will be single inheritance. So these are reference ontologies. They are asserted ontologies. Blue car is a defined class. There is no universal blue car, but we can talk as if there were a universal blue car because we can formulate the definition of a blue car. A blue car is a car which is blue. That's not an extra universal. As is proved by the fact, you might repaint it. So unpacking is what I was talking about earlier. If you have a well-formulated ontology, you should be able to take every term in the ontology and unpack its definition so you get a longer definition, and then unpack all the terms in that definition so you get an even longer definition. And eventually you would get a completely unpacked definition, which should still make sense. It should still be correct English or correct OWL, whichever way you do it. And then you should be able to substitute that definition in any sentence in which the original term occurs and get still get a, a sentence which has the same truth value. We saw the FMA example. We should be able to substitute the term plasma membrane with the definition and still get a correct definition. So here we have eliminated plasma membrane and we still have a correct definition. You can rely on that being possible for all the terms in the FMA which are defined. Uh, so substitution. If a definition is correct, then we can substitute the definition for the term defined in all contexts and preserve truth. Now, that's not quite true. What we mean is in all transparent contexts. So it could be that somebody understands the term but de doesn't understand the definition. Th that's not a transparent context. That's an opaque context, which means it involves knowledge or belief. So John knows that a leukocyte is an animal cell, but he does not know that an achromatic cell of the myeloid or lymphoid lineages capable of amoeboid movement is an animal cell. Definitions should be concise, so uh, we, we can see uh, this problem here. So this is the National Cancer Institute's thesaurus definition of tuberculosis. What they really meant to say is that. That's the properly definitional part. The rest is just chatter. So it's not part of the 
definition to know that 90 to 95 percent of primary TB infections may go unrecognized. That is just chatter. To be concise, you shouldn't have any definitions as proper parts. You should reuse the terms which have already been defined to save space and thereby to increase readability, both by humans and by computers. You shouldn't build in superfluous explanations or journalistic stories or encyclopedic knowledge. You should just define what is logically needed to specify the jointly sufficient and individually necessary conditions for being an instance of that thing. No examples, um, no ellipses, no usually or in general. It has to be necessary and sufficient conditions rather than what typically is the case. 